delighted to have Neve Shaw with us here tonight. And uh, Neve is going to tell us about her adventures in science communication and what it's like to be a science communicator, but to be part of the story as well. So we're all really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Neve. So you're, you're very welcome. Thanks, Sean. Thanks very much. It's a privilege to speak to my fellow writers. Um, you know, I still kind of struggle with calling myself that because um, I always feel like that the people that get to be writers are the people that kind of train and do courses and stuff in it. But I'm 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 a very mixed bag. And I guess that I'm learning that that's just I am some sort of a mutt when it comes to communication. I'm, I use many different avenues. So um, I'm going to just take you through a little bit of some of my adventures and and what I was what I've been trying to achieve and and where I'm at with it you know so um I've been I don't know if it's a curse or a good thing but I've been my passion has always kind of driven my whole life um which means that I I don't have a conventional life in the sense that I think most of us uh want to need it I mean I I need it but I, I it's just not going to happen you know so so I, I'm never in the same place for very long I don't have the same amount of possessions as everybody else. Like I don't, I don't own a home or, you know, I, I don't have much um kind of material goods, but that's because, you know, it's always about me <laughs> trying to be able to, uh you know, achieve what I'm trying to do, which is always about communicating science and stuff. So, so this, I love this Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos, of course, is um formerly of Amazon and now kind of leading up Blue Origin. And, and he actually created Amazon in order to make enough money for him to be able to fly rockets. So, so there's been a few kind of things that help me sort of go, okay, you're you are making progress, Neve. You are you are getting there. And and two things that happened in the last year, which I'm particularly proud about, is one is um uh the European Space Agency acknowledged my work in communicating space, particularly around education. Um uh I think it was 2021, but we really only kind of kicked in last year and so uh, as one of the um one of their champions we get um vip invitations to a lot of their events and they rely on us to sort of get the get the story out to to our community so uh, getting that recognition was was huge for me because sometimes you're working away you don't know if you're making any impact at all and then most recently just this summer i got um i i applied as a to the explorers club and I applied really just to kind of because I um it's it's weird in my in my science communication it's becoming as much about being an explorer as it is about space because I'm I'm connecting the two things together through climate change and so I just applied you know just to see what they do and when I put in my application they said you could actually apply to be a full member so put in your full membership so I put in an application for my full membership but then they came back and made me a fellow because they felt that the work that I was doing was of um, of importance for science but also in just spreading the word around why we explore and just behind that element of curiosity so they're little ticks that kind of keep me going you know and then the other one is this one and and this is a nod to to last summer and this is chris hadfield and this is a picture that was taken back in 2013 and uh, chris hadfield is a canadian astronaut for the non-space people and uh he kind of captivated ireland when he was up on the international space station on his six month uh, mission because he was the first one really to acknowledge Ireland in his tweets and social media and um and and it kind of captured a whole new attention in Ireland around space exploration so he came that winter um uh, to promote his book and this is me actually photo bombing him uh, he's not actually standing beside me with a picture even though it looks like that but then last summer um I was invited by UCD to actually um have a chat with him on on stage and again it's one of those moments like wow I can't believe I actually got that gig that's amazing so rather than than photobombing myself I actually asked him for a real selfie and he was very he was very good about that so these for me are moments where I kind of go okay I'm doing something right and um, I'm I'm communicating there's definitely an audience for it so so I'm very happy around that so and then um I was asked then in, in 2018 was it 2018 yeah it was 2018 uh to write a book it had been this was the fourth person and it was it was lovely Patrick O'Donnell who I'm sure many of us know from Mercy yeah. Press he said I, I really think you have a story there to tell yeah. I had never read anything that extensively before was absolutely terrified and I said to him okay I'll give it a go but you have to promise me that if it's if it's not good enough just kind of, we'll just get rid of this idea he promised to me that and I got put I got putting it together and um finished it um, finished it in, in I think it was around about 
October 2019 and we were all set for a big launch. Um, I think it was the 27th of um, the 27th of March in um, in Hodges Figgis there on Dawson Street. And 10 days previously, the whole country went into lockdown because of COVID. So I never I never know how the book would have gone. But um, I know that a lot of people were very supportive and and bought it during the pandemic. But book sales definitely was difficult to predict how it would have done. But that also was a very interesting exercise for me as a as a communicator. I'd never done that before. And then um, another another thing I'm very proud of is I was um, STEM ambassador then for the Irish Girl Guide Centre in 1919 to 2020 and it kind of spilled into the into the lockdown for a bit as well and then most recently um i've written three articles for the irish times and in the middle of writing another one now and that's another thing like that's a that's a that's a huge thing for me because i've read i've read those columns for years and i respect highly the people that write for the irish times so you know to have been asked to write from my perspective about space it was an honor um indeed and as you say Sean the way I write and the way I communicate it's not it's not science communication in the classic sense it's I feel it's it's slightly different than that it's always from a very human perspective and so the appetite for that is different than the general reader for uh, you know of, of popular science and and that's where I sit so having been allowed to write these three articles for the Irish Times. I'm I'm really, really chopped to bits uh, to do it. And as I say, I have another one in the pipeline. And all the time, um, you know, since I've started this journey, it's it's always been about also connecting with the uh, with the people out there with schools. You know, in the last few years, I've been funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And there's been two kind of projects that I've been that I've really kind of been teasing out and thinking about and one was science week live where we did a, a live stream show to highlight all the things that were happening in science week for for ty's i did that in 2021 and 2022 and uh, we did a lovely full production show of that last year and then this second one was funded by sfi was shush at the library where i was working with libraries to find communities who are kind of outside of the the world where I would normally do public talks and um, and events, and they're the the people that have a poor relationship with science. And so I did my work. It went very very small, but very much one to one. And I found that very rewarding. And I and I would say that it's probably the work I'm most proud of actually in, in the last couple of years. So so I've been developing as a as a communicator, and as you say at the start of this the thing that I'm always trying to do is I'm always trying to find the human side of, of space. And so I kind of use myself to do that. I'll just leave that go. Um, the most recent mission that I've been doing, and I haven't even started pulling, pulling this together was I, I, I work with Europlanet, which is a, a European wide organization for uh, people in the geosciences. And they had a fund. It's gone there. It was an amazing fund um, where they would, um, provide people an opportunity to go to an analog facility, which is a facility that simulates a part of the world that is similar to, uh, uh, you know, the moon or, or one of the planets. And this was the Makadigadi salt pan in Botswana that I went to. And I joined a team of scientists from Nairobi and, and Botswana. And they were looking at these mounds in the middle of the Makadigadi salt pan to, and their behavior is very similar to the behavior of the surface of Mars. So, I shadowed them and I basically tried to catch their human story and they rarely took pictures of their work or anything in the field. So already um, we had more than enough um, information to help them in terms of their science mission. But for me, mine has only begun because I haven't even started writing about it. But you see in the top right hand corner, this actually happened when we were in the field. So the day before that very location, we had parked up and um, that's a line. And he has just killed a zebra. We'd seen many zebra uh, all the time. And we'd seen many bison and ostrich. And then obviously horses, you know, the, the normal things you see in the wild. And um, Fulvio, this Italian guy who runs the kind of um, the, the analog mission, he he was always reassuring us. No, no, the lion always come just during the wet season. This is perfectly fine during the dry season, which is the salt pan. During the wet season, the salt pan fills water and it's an absolute smorgasbord of all sorts of wildlife, almost like a safari so we were driving to our next location. <laughs> I caught the line out of out of the corner of my eyes. There's a line. 
And he was just in shock because in his 10 years of going in and going out of this Makati Kati Sopan, he'd never seen a lion, least of all, and just just killed a zebra. So, um, yeah, sometimes ignorance is bliss. And it also showed me how comfortable I'm getting about being outside my comfort zone when I'm doing all these different um, expeditions. So the explorer slash communicator is, is starting to kind of come into my life and I'm not stopping it. I'm just I'm just letting it happen. And this is a mission very similar to another mission that I went on in Utah, which I'll, I'm going to break down and explain how I humanize that that particular mission, because I'm going to do the same thing with this one. And um, and then I have an upcoming one next November in two six weeks away in November. And this is another another mission that I that I've been thinking about doing in the same way that I've I've did this mission in the Utah desert. This is a um, a global leadership project which is run out of an, an Australian organization called Homeward Bound, where they um, every year they um, recruit 100 women from the sciences, STEM, M, M there at the end in Australia is medicine and includes medicine, the second M. And uh, we get involved in a, a leadership program online for, gosh, it's been 18 months now at this stage. And it culminates in a, a conference on a boat and they bring us to the Antarctic because they kind of want to shock us into reality around uh, climate change and force us to really challenge ourselves about what are you actually doing to communicate climate change. So it's no vacation. This is going to be full on work every day, uh, working with different groups of women um, from environmental science, climate science, biology, uh, communicators like myself, engineers, um, all with a passion for finding a way of bringing climate change to the people that their community. And for me, it's I've been working more and more about connecting our planet with space because space is just one of those things that people I find are are very connected with naturally. And um, since my mission in Utah, which I'll talk about later, I I really started thinking about how space can be used for the whole um, for the whole message around taking care of our planet and remembering that we're on this planet. Anyway, so I'm doing that in November. If you have any spare cash, I'd love some support. My GoFundMe page, if you just go GoFundMe, Neve Shaw, you'll find it. So um, let's go through some of my space highlights and then I'll try and explain why I put myself in the middle of it and what it is I'm, I'm trying to do. So um, it started, it's, it's, it's deeply human and personal because... Um, my relationship with space is deeply human and, power and personal, as is as is science. So when I was a kid, um, you know, uh, science was sort of what we did as a family. Uh, you know, we had the encyclopedias. We watched Cosmos with Carl Sagan. We watched all the David Attenborough programs. It was sort of our glue. Uh, we weren't really the most emotional family. Um, there was a bit of chaos, but but education and being curious was very much encouraged in us and we were told from a very young age that we were going to go to college that's a big deal because my neither of my parents went to college and uh, we weren't necessarily uh, we weren't wealthy at all uh, we weren't like on the uh, we weren't on the streets either but that was a massive sacrifice for them and I felt the burden of that from a very young age that I had to I had to get to college. I had to fulfill what my parents had planned for me. And, and I did. And, you know, I, I went and I did a degree in engineering and a master's in engineering and, and all that kind of stuff. And I loved it. But something was always missing for me. And I felt an obligation to to educate myself. And it was a privilege to have the opportunity to do, do that and for my parents to invest in me. Um, um, but space was always my thing. Space and performance were always my thing. And this is the sun, the Earthrise picture. And for me, my imagination around space began when I saw that one summer doing a project at home, a comic, a comic book about Saturn. And as a kid, you know, it's the most normal thing in the world to make a promise to yourself that you're going to stand on the moon and see the Earth. And I can remember that excited feeling that I'd get that 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 was going to be me. I was always fascinated with explorers. And, um, you know, it was the only part of history, I think, that really kind of connected with me and stuck with me. So that was that was definitely going to happen in my life. And then, you know, what's really interesting is, is that when you become a teenager. I, I don't I don't know about everybody else, but for me, definitely um, insecurities came. I was bullied badly. We moved around a lot in the last school that I was in in sixth class. I was bullied badly. I don't know if that if that affected me, but my self-belief just exited the room. And I 
kind of just did what was sort of laid out as as a sort of a life path and the passion started to kind of go down uh, uh, quite a lot for me and as a hard worker and as I say I got my degree in engineering in UCD and my master's and then I went traveling for a year and came back and did a PhD then in food science also in UCD Uh, loved the PhD loved the scientific process I'm not sure I have the discipline for it I think my brain works too fast and I think I'm a visual person and so um, when I started doing a postdoc I can remember feeling very disillusioned burnt out and realizing that I I really this really wasn't the career for me I wasn't getting a kick out of it I got a kick out of the PhD but I really wasn't getting a kick out of this and so at the time um, it was right for me to step away um, because I think my relationship with science was like Ah, it was it was bitter. It was, you know, I, I'd forgotten how lucky I was to have the education that I had and always been a performer, always writing, um, you know, on my own poetry and writing plays and stuff for the house. I decided to kind of pursue that for a while. And um, and I did that. And I uh, uh, it was terrifying at the time, you know, to step away from all those years of education. But I knew I needed a kind of a, a refresher or a rethink. And uh, I got very lucky very quickly because I think um, when you've been through stuff and, you know, I, I had a marriage breakdown and um, I, I think I had I think I had a slight nervous breakdown um, when I was after finishing the PhD, because I think I pushed myself so hard and I was so sure that this purpose that I had been told as a young child to go to college and stuff I kind of trusted it and when it kind of let me down I didn't know who I was I didn't know where I was going um and I brought that kind of to my acting and so um I started acting again in Cork just as I was coming out of finishing my 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 postdoc and I found that I was getting work and I, I got good work uh, as as an actor and so I thought mm, maybe I'll just step away for a bit and try this and I did and I loved it and um, <clears throat> then around the late 2000s I was very lucky that I got to work with a very progressive theatre company called A New Productions and I, I I think if you google them you'll see they're they're very prolific and they do a lot around um, Ireland's history social history and they were about to just explode and I happened to be in the right place at the right time with them because by being involved with them, I got associated with the quality of the work that they make. So opportunities came my way. And I was at a point where I had an awful lot to say um, myself. And as an actor, you're given other people's words. And I realized I had too much to say for myself. And I really was interested in the big ideas that science were um, looking at, particularly at the time, the Higgs particle and, the, you know, the, the uh, what was going on in CERN. And I had been reading about it and I and I still felt very guilty about this person that had all this education. And yet there I was as an actor. And I, I just was like, what's wrong with me? What why is it that I <laughs> I seem to need to do so many things and everybody else is like so focused, you know, and um, this first theatre show I got support from because I was working with a new productions and they have um, an initiative. I think it's gone now um, during the Dublin Fringe called Show in a Bag. And what you do is you get all this support from a theatre company called Fish Amble and they're, they they encourage new writing. And Bewley's Theatre, uh, which was a theatre um, venue at the time, they give you free space and you get a stage director, you get all the you get all the technical support. So all you have to do is write it and, and perform it. And so um, I would said, right, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about particle physics and I'm going to talk about this idea that I have that, you know, the string theory around particle physics is a great parallel for figuring out your life choices. And, and I was, I was kind of teasing that apart. And this is when the first scary moment kind of came up for me because I genuinely thought that if I just wrote about particle physics, that people would find that interesting, that it would be like a lecture. And um, the uh, the director at the time and the, the team said, no, 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 Eve, you're going to have to put yourself into this. And I was like, but I'm not interesting. And they're going, no, we don't want to hear about, you know, what you had for breakfast. But why you care about particle physics is actually more interesting than particle physics 
to a theatre audience. And I was like, oh, I'd never seen it that way. Because, of course, you know, we science people, we love, we love information, right? So I was like, oh, my God. So I had to share why I was fascinated with this. And I remember writing that and going through that and crying and just being absolutely terrified. And I remember the night before the first show, I was I was shaking and I, I, I was so scared. I couldn't remember my lines. I'd never had a problem remembering my lines. But anyway, it all came together on the day because in front of an audience, you get this just this will of of support and people really liked it. They really liked it. And it it made me really think about the power of putting a person in the middle of a kind of a dense science topic. And that was what people came back to me with. So a lot of the arts community came back and said, that was really helpful. You, you've you really helped me understand. Um, I, I'm, I'm not afraid now to pick up the paper and read about CERN. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Because I had thought about that. I, I, ma- I made it because I was on some sort of mission to understand what is wrong with me, you know? So, so that was great. But a really interesting thing happened that started the space thing. So I'm looking at all these different versions of my life right in this show because string theory says, you know, that we're vibrating strings of energy and that those vibrating strings of energy mathematically have to exist on on the 10th dimension. And so I did all this analysis of, of dimensions and, you know, I looked at the fifth dimension as possibly being this dimension of possibilities and that, you know, um, if we if we exist on the 10th dimension. So I said, well, if I'm made of strings, then I can look down in dimensions lower than myself and I can look at these possible outcomes of my life. And I made videos as if each of those lives existed. <clears throat> and I, you know, so so the person that stayed married, the person that stayed working in, in UCC and my postdoc, uh, the person who who stayed on in their first job in engineering with the London Underground. I love that job, by the way. And um, the person who wanted to go to space as a kid, the person who wanted to be a ballerina. And I was able to make uh, videos of, of if all these lives existed. But I really struggled with the person who wanted to go to space because I hadn't done anything about it. And I I, I went, gosh, that's mad. Because I talk to people all the time about how I would have loved to have been an astronaut, you know, in parties. And yet I've never taken even an, an astronomy class. And I would... I would have thought of myself as somebody that kind of dives in and, you know, I did parachute jumps and all this. And I realized that I was, that there was a big con going on. And um, it happened because I I contacted the European Space Agency and asked them for a loan of a flight suit. And so we were making a <clears throat> the space version of Neve. So I was wearing this flight suit. And I lined up all these different clips of science fiction that I, I liked. So, so I'll show you that piece first. We all love to on the music. And so it was a funny thing, right? So it was a light, it was going to be a light piece for the show because space to me was always about positivity and just everything that's amazing in the world is connected around space because it was, it was everywhere in the place. But the weird thing was, was the more I wore the this flight suit <clears throat> the more it was clear to me that i was never ever ever going to be an astronaut that i had been talking absolute codswallop about it and that lovely glow of excitement that i that i had around space was in danger of going out and if that went out i really was worried about what was ever going to excite me in my life so I really had a moment and I caught it on camera. I feel more sad. It feels very real that I'm not an astronaut. Now, I know that sounds very like, obviously I'm not an astronaut, right? But it was a huge moment for me that I had worked and worked and worked and worked and studied and studied and studied and just kept myself busy, 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 busy. But the one thing I really loved, no focus to, and I was very shocked that I had done that with my life. I was 40, <clears throat> I was 41 at the time. And I really felt I'd missed my mark. I'd missed my time. And it got me really thinking about why, as you get older, do you think you've missed your mark? Um, is it is it Ireland? Is it around the world? Is it because I'm a woman? And so it became clear to me that I had to explore that. Firstly, I had to, I had to, 
I, I was running out of time. So I had to go for this thing about, well, what happens if I actually devote my life to space and see, see if I can get to space? And secondly, why can't we have a third or fourth or a fifth career? What, what's, what was the story I was telling myself that was preventing me from actually having the career that I've always wanted? And, 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 and is it because I'm a woman? Or is it because I'm Irish? And and so there was huge amounts of food for thought. And that's what you're looking for when you're trying to write a, a theatre piece. So I was like, right, I have to explore this. And I was terrified. So this happened in August 2011. And the following year, September 2012, I um I had the guts to kind of do something about it. So I I went here. I went to Black Rock Castle Observatory because I brought that show. That's about the science of this to them. And I said... I, I think I'm ready to write my second show, um, but I, I kind of would like some support. And they made me their artist in residence. And together, thank God for SFI, I got a small fund to write this second show about space. And again, it was going to just be about the amazing, some of the amazing stories about space. But it had to also be about why I had neglected my passion for space and when that happened and the choices that I made and, and what I need to do about that. And that became the next show um, to space. And what was really weird, all those years I'd been sitting around and within weeks of, of becoming the artist and resident of Black Rock Castle Observatory, they introduced me to their network and my relationship with ESA began. And that was that began in 2014. And I got funding. Thank you so much, SFI. I got funding and then I was off, you know, and terrified again, absolutely terrified. But it was with. Uh, with a new community of people who who really nurtured and helped me. And at this stage, I'm a theatre maker. You know, um, I'm a theatre maker, even though I, I've always loved when I was in the rehearsal room, you know, with artists and stuff, I was always sort of explaining, just checking my time, yeah. I was always explaining um, science to them. And a lot of the work that I was doing with Anu was was coming in, uh, giving the scientific attitude to different um human settings that were coming up so I was starting to develop that muscle so anyway from from that spacesuit moment and with SFI support and Azero Ireland and Black Rock Castle Observatory, Observatory this show my second show Two Space was formed another personal piece and um, it talked about uh, Mars um, at the time you had Mars One and you had, um, you know, so you had space agencies versus these sort of commercial companies that were just coming up. And I was talking about that. I was talking about, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> that stars are looking into our past, which made me look at my past. And so, again, it was personal versus um, uh, space itself. And it really looked at what happened in my life and and you know, that moment that that changed, which was the moment that happened in the previous show and, and what I did after that, you know. So that show um, was on in the fringe again, and it was supported by the Arts Council this time, as well as um, SFI. And um, being part of the fringe, um, this time there was a lot of interest because space was just starting to come up into the public domain. I mean, it's everywhere now, but that was just kind of starting around 2014. So I was invited to bring it to Edinburgh. So I got funding from um, Culture Ireland to bring it to Edinburgh, to Edinburgh Fringe. And I also brought it to Adelaide Fringe the, the following the following year. And it just went on and on and on and on and on. And it never it never stopped. And then from that, um, I started kind of just being interested in general in sharing news about space. So obviously, this is the International um, Space Station. And I started to become a uh, uh, a kind of a reporter of, of sorts. Now, th this is a pic picture of me from October um, 2021 when I, that was the first time I got to go to NASA Kennedy and I was and I was covering the story of Matthias Maurer. And so that was the, uh, the second European astronaut to go to the International Space Station from NASA Kennedy. And the first one being uh, Thomas Pesquet. Um, my relationship with ESA had developed at this stage that they, they put me on their... Um, their foreign national press list to cover these launches. But I couldn't get out of Ireland at the time because the pandemic was on when Thomas was 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 launching. So the next one was Matthias. But then one of the crew members got sick. So I was there and I never got to cover the launch because they didn't fly till three weeks later and I had to go back to Ireland for for, for Science Week. Um and so um this is the one um this is the, this is the mission that I, I'm talking about that that really made a, a difference. So 
after I finished making Two Space, I got to go for the summer in 2015 to the um, International Space University Space Studies Program every summer. It was in Ohio. And I was suddenly in a room with people who normalized these crazy dreams that I had. And they really liked the fact that I was bringing this artistic human element to uh, the topic of, of space. And my group from 2015 wanted to set up a team to go to a facility in Utah uh, where there is a research station for people who are interested in um, any discipline around researching Mars. And so I was with geologists uh, who are interested in that topic. And um, they asked me to join them as their um, artist, their crew journalist and their artist. And I said, brilliant. OK, so let's do a funding campaign. So I want to break down what I did. I've kind of been all my current, like my current mission to Botswana and the one that I'm going to do in our Antarctic. This is the kind of thing um, that I want to. This is how I want to cover it. So I interviewed them beforehand. I I had a load of GoPros on on or on them every single day. We went outside on our on our missions because we were simulating life on Mars. So every time you go outside, you you wear a spacesuit. Um, and I wanted to simulate the not simulate. I wanted to capture the living conditions because I found that anybody that had been here before on the Mars Desert Research Station or MDRS, run by the Mars Society, a lot of the reporting and you have to do a ton of reports when you're there for for mission for the for mission control. Um, they were all focused around the positive results. They were focused around the science. They were focused around celebrating being, you know, uh, an analog, um, an analog astronaut, which is what they're called. But nobody really was talking about the reality of what it's like to actually live like that for a sustained period of time. And that's what I wanted to capture. I wanted to capture the reality because, uh, you know, when people think of, of space stations and, and spacecraft, they think of everything white and clean and pristine and and. You know, if we are going to go to Mars, it's not going to be like that at all. It's going to be very, very difficult and it's going to be dirty and we're going to have things are going to break down and all that. So that's the I wanted to get to the gritty, grimy part of of, of space exploration, human space exploration. So they were the crew that I went with. This was the crew that I went with and we were crew 173 and um, we did a fundraising. So I, I made this movie beforehand. Hola, I'm Arnaud Pons from Barcelona, Spain. This is where... My name is Michaela Musilova and I'm from Slovakia. Hello, I'm Roy and I'm from Israel. This to get people to fund us. And then before the mission, um, I did a load of talks um, about the, the scientific integrity of what we were doing and then um, interviewed, got all of them to tell me about why they were going on this mission beforehand. So today is December 11th. Well, was coming from I'm Israel, heading home. And it was coming from Slovakia. And I want to tell you why I want to go to MDRS, <laughs> why I signed up from to Ireland. MDRS. Hi, captured all that. And then when we were there, as I say, I had a load of GoPros. I had um, audio recording equipment. I had my cameras. Uh, we had lined up uh, schools to talk to that were personally connected with them. So that was the only time we broke the 12 minute delay that you that you keep always when you're communicating with mission control and, and the rest of the world, because it was too important to get that out there. And um, I took a load of videos. So this is me kind of walking and uh, pretending to be on mission. I took a load of videos because I knew that after the mission was over, having video would be very important. So I took a load of video of them, took a load of photographs of them took a load of video of me. So when I described it, I would I would have all this content. I did a whole video about the interior and you can see how gritty and grimy it was. And, and this was sort of a perspective that I hadn't seen about MDRS um, before. Um, yeah, I'll keep going there. And so then also uh, when, when we suit up, um, this is upstairs at the, at the facility. I wanted to show how small the space was and um, how every day it was. Um, the cramped conditions, um, then what it was like to put the suit on. It was very claustrophobic. I wanted them to see that it that the helmet was homemade. It was made with first specs of sort of one of those bins, the, those round bins that you kind of throw the rubbish into. Um, I wanted them to understand how difficult it was to breathe, how claustrophobic it was, how the how the inside of the helmet would fog up. It was a pain in the neck, and um, you had the steel collar. It would. It would. It would. It would um, I would, we were all covered in these kind of sores and blistered in our shoulders because 
of the equipment that we were carrying. And then on top of that, then you're supposed to drive over these ATVs to go and get more of the samples and climb up the mountains. And I had a fear of height um, all the time. And it pushed you hard. Like you would get up at seven o'clock every day and I wouldn't get to bed till one o'clock by the time I had my reports on. So yeah, it never you? stopped. It was like full on for 15 days. Um, as I say, I had time lapses and stuff. This was the science lab. Um, I had time lapses and um, I took a ton of photographs and um, there was audio recording. Greetings from crew 173. <laughs> We're getting a series of questions from um, our followers um, and so we're going videos, to try and answer all of them. Uh, Hugh Burn, Burn who has sponsored us, has asked us this um, question. Um, every time Facebook. we go outside, do we have to wear a suit? And so I had and all these so amazing um, photographs. Like? And um, and then once once everybody once the mission was over, it seemed to it just seemed to happen at a time that the world was just really starting to think about these things. So all of us had a really strong um, response uh, from each of our countries for interviews and everything. And I had to kind of just put kind of media packs together for all of them and, and send them all to them. And I also wanted to do a kind of an art piece when I was there as well, something that kind of mattered to me and and. I am um, I'm still I'm still I'm still inspired by this stuff. So I made this short piece called Heart of the Mission and the heart of the mission was the kitchen. It was the kitchen table. What made that mission was not that we were in the middle of the Utah desert and it wasn't that we were uh, conducting science. It was that I was having this extremely difficult and challenging experience with four other people and it, it manifested itself sometimes with tensions or for laughter, but we always ate together at the, at the end of the day. So the, so the soul of the mission was that table. And so um, I tried to represent that in, in my, in the short movie. Let me show you the book. So what I did was I got them all and, and that radio was just the beating heart of the mission. You know? Right. This is what you do all day on the radio, over. all day, and this is the world. And I forgot about my life back home. Mike does not Completely work forgot about my life back now. home. And I was perfectly happy to live. I really enjoyed living with the group. You can still look at it, you two. I'm not looking at you. Look. Nobody look at me. <laughs> <laughs> because most of the time now I live on my own. Maybe there was a bit of that, like loneliness or something because of my age, I don't know. Um, but we all kind of went our separate. For the I did that and, and, and so it was awesome. important to share that with you because it, um, I, I left there with a, with a completely different understanding of water, um, all the stuff in my house. Uh, I had lived with nothing and all I, and I was perfectly, I was actually blissfully happy with the exception of missing my family I didn't miss any of my material possessions I had my computer I had enough clothes to go on and I started realizing that I had that capability to to be a sort of an explorer and a and a, and a kind of an adventurer I never would have thought that you know because I was always afraid of my shadow as a kid growing up and so I I was hugely inspired by but I was really inspired by trying to bring that idea of you know, we started as a species with nothing and this planet gave us water and air and food. And we've kind of forgotten that we're that we're not in charge, that the planet's in charge. And so climate change started really kind of becoming an obvious connection for me about space and particularly humanizing it and putting myself in extreme situations and extreme environments helped me make that connection with people. And I've gone on to use it for, for climate change and in other work that I've done. It also inspired another play. I didn't expect that to happen either. So my third pl play before I stepped away is it's from a theater maker was Diary of a Martian Beekeeper because the thing that I, I've always found interesting about human space exploration is that it's kind of like being in the lab. It's There's a rigor to it and there is a monotony to it and there's a repetition to it. And it's about, it's about, working together as a team and sticking to the protocol 
um, to the letter because otherwise, you know, it, it's too dangerous. And so I wanted to make a show that captured all the people that allow one person get to space and that one person's life being completely devoted to the mission and to conduct the science in every in, in its purest form. And so I made Diary of a Martian Beekeeper uh, set in the future where I had gone and fulfilled my dream and that I brought bees to Mars to help pollinate plants and that we had come up with some experiment that I'd worked with my father on. And, um, and that show was about that, but it was also showing how lonely a dream is and how it can push you and, and actually put you in a place where you're kind of trapped by it, but because you believe in it so much, that's what matters most of all. And, and so that's what Diary of a Martian Beekeeper was. And it was actually a love letter to my dad as well, because my dad kept popping up in the previous two shows. And I think I wanted to thank my dad for, for giving me that joy of learning and, and my confidence around being able to communicate um, dense science topics. So these are just a few pictures. So minimal set. It was, um, I was in a hab or habitat on my own, uh, you know, waiting for this delivery of bees to come. And I like the parallels between the bee suit and the space suit. And also that a bee colony is sort of, if we are as a species going to colonize another planet or to live on another planet, uh, every bee has a job. And I think it's the perfect community uh, in order for, for harmony to happen. So there was a lot of things going on in that mo in that, in that show. And so that was the third show. But by the time I'd finished that, I really felt that I had, um, that I, I, I sort of was communicating with a group of people that go to theatre. And they weren't the people that I actually really wanted to start talking about science with. As much as I loved it, it felt that um, there was a greater need in, in the community uh, than in theatre. And I was sort of, I was sort of kind of uh, just entertaining myself. I'm not sure how I was, I was in the need of others as a community. So I stepped away from, from theatre for a while. And yeah, I guess the next the next development of that was, was writing the book, which I really enjoyed. But I really started thinking about, I, I kind of, after that Mars mission, I really felt I had a, I had an obligation as a, as a communicator to do more. And so I started looking, um, I'm just going to go back now. I really started thinking about working in the community, you know, and um, I had done all these talks, you know, I've been very lucky. I, I think I'm a good, I think I'm a good speaker and I'm, and I'm capable of, get, of getting people passionate about, you know, thinking about what it is they want to do with their life and passionate about what I'm passionate about, which is about, about space and science. And I, you know, I got to speak at like New Scientist Live and, and Wired and, I've done TED talks and I've I've contributed to science um you know to science week events and and space week events and I started kind of becoming interested in in people who didn't know anything about science week who didn't know anything about space week who who wouldn't think any they wouldn't ever dream for a second to go to a theater show and I mean I think there's a greater need with that group of people and and so in the last couple of funding rounds um, with uh, SFI, I've I've worked with libraries to um, to explore what their communities need. And I and I think that it's I think it's well, for me, it's the most rewarding work. And I think it's the work I'm most proud with. And that's what I was said at the very start, the Shush at the Library project, which I ran um, last year, it was funded by SFI. I worked with three libraries, one in Loud. Uh, that's my hometown in Dundalk, uh, Kildare, because I had been working with Kildare a lot and um, and Dublin and, and Tala. And I worked with uh, teachers and I worked with libraries and I said, where's the need? Where where do you think people are not connecting with science? And we found very small groups of people. Uh, I worked with one group of women um, that had all um, emigrated to Ireland uh, from across Europe uh, who were all mothers and their relationship with science was damaged from a very early age. And I spent the year kind of talking about that and uh, communicating topics of science that they found interesting. And then at the end of that, like last Science Week, they got up and they presented on topics that they found interesting about science. And it was, I was so proud of them. I, re I really was. And so I applied, I hope, I don't know if I'll get it now, but I applied for funding this year to extend that project because I saw the effect that it has. And 
I guess I'm I'm leaning more towards now older people and um I because they're the guardians of our future generation and, and you know my parents inspired me and gave me confidence around science and I grew up in that home but from my work with um working with people in the community and in the arts community that's not the norm and it's it's definitely um less frequent than than we want it to be so if I can help parents develop their relationship around science to be a more healthy one then maybe we can change that for for future generations and that's the work I work on so why do I put myself front and center in my work for that reason because when I go into um a room uh I'm kind of like the explorer but I'm I'm using that as a device to bring the science with me because I do a lot of research about everything that I'm doing and every aspect of that Mars mission, I knew it inside out. I knew everything about Mars, the planet. And I I told them about that experience, my toilets blocking and the food being salty and how difficult it was to wear those helmets. I focused on the things that are very relatable. And then they would just naturally, after I'd finished talking, whether it was to schools or parents, or whatever, after I would finished giving a very human side to that mission, they would ask questions that were scientific they would ask about you know what is mars like um how feasible would it be um <clears throat> how did the pump work um uh what's um what's that what's the ventilation like in the house like they, they um you know uh how close are we to exploring mars and you get into different missions and stuff so it became a, a very com comfortable entry point for me to talk about science and i guess because i'm not a full-time scientist anymore and I don't work in a lab I feel I've, I'm feel more comfortable doing that and I feel like what I do differently I um is by humanizing science and making it feel every day that maybe I'm breaking down barriers around science so that's my whistle stop tour uh around uh the topic of uh my adventures in science communication and um as I say I'm going now to the Antarctic in November and the model that I kind of developed on that Mars mission um, in Utah I'm going to bring to the Antarctic mission and I've already started working on that in, in Botswana and the idea of the Antarctic is that it's another extreme environment and it's working with um, 90 other women in STEM we're trying to tackle climate change on a boat with a three and a half week full-on conference every day so thanks Sean. Thanks, thanks very much Neil. it was fascinating God really you were very honest with a lot of the things you said there so Brilliant story. Yeah. Um, Olive Heffernan was one of our members was listening and she says, this is so interesting. My nine year old daughter is loving it, too. I didn't <laughs> catch how long the Utah Mars simulation lasted. Can you tell us about that again? Uh, yeah. She also says, I also totally agree with the person who says her interest in particle physics is even more interesting than particle physics. <laughs> interest in her subject and her exploration of that interest is just fascinating. Thank you, Olive. Yeah, so the mission was only 15 days and it's mad. You know, I remember going in and being absolutely terrified because a lot of the people that I met when I did this space studies program, they were years ahead of me in terms of being very comfortable with their passion around space. And they had carved their careers around this connection that they had with space. And they were geologists and astrobiologists. They were well used to living in the field. They'd been camping all the time. They had all the equipment. You should have seen <coughs> the packing list that I had to bring, I, I, I had to go like everything I took, I, like every single item, there was a two page list I, I got. And they all laughed at me when I got there because you don't need half of it, but I got it because they asked me to get it. And um, I went in, my suitcase was was jammers with all this stuff. And like, I only had room for two pairs of trousers and, and four tops. And the mission was just 15 days. And it's mad, but after about four or five days, you just get into a routine, you know, you go to bed at the same time, you get up, you have breakfast together, you plan your day, somebody goes out on a walk, which is an EVA, so somebody has to stay listening to the radio while they do that, they come in, somebody makes lunch, somebody's on cleaning duty, you do all your reports in the afternoon, uh, then you make dinner, uh, you sit down, you have a talk, I'm doing all my, I'm, I'm taking all the content off the GoPros and the cameras and trying to come up with you know, I had to always have at least five photographs with descriptions to give back to mission control every day and do a summary report. And I'd go to bed around about one o'clock in the morning because the bandwidth was so bad. I'd always try and post something on Facebook. And around day five, Roy, he was the Israeli geologist. He came out of his room, these tiny rooms, and he had money in his hand. And I remember kind of going, oh, that's mad. We don't, 
there's absolutely no need for money here. Uh, none whatsoever. I hadn't even thought of it. Like, whereas even just the, the second of meeting them, it was like coffee, 149, you know, um, staying in the hotel the night before getting a bus, having to buy all that equipment. It was like money, money, money. And then money's gone. And what's important now is, is our water going to run out? Um, you know, do we have enough food? Um, uh, and you'd be obsessed. You were obsessed with the weather. I just was obsessed with the weather and I was obsessed with my water level. And it made me realize that we, I've kind of gone, I'd kind of forgotten about the time, um, you know, I'd spent um, outdoors as a kid and all that was gone, you know, but yeah. Anyway, I hope that answers your question, Olive. I see you're going there, so I'll stop that. Uh, I have a question, actually, for, you know, yeah. that moment that you described, you described that really well, you know, I really felt for you in that moment where you thought, OK, it's never going to happen. But you yeah. seem to have kind of re recovered your mojo a bit on that. So are you believing again that it can can happen? Going to yeah, I, I, I have to. I mean, I I have to, you know, Sean, it's kind of like um, it's it's like your passion. It's like what Jeff Bezos says, you don't go looking for your passion, your passion finds you. So either you can acknowledge it or or not. And so what I've done is, is I've kind of moved my life around that. So I love communicating. I love talking to people and I and I really like writing. And so what I've done is I've just focused everything in that direction. And I'm having a terrific life in in fulfilling my passion. And the idea is, is that if I do a really good job, if I if I can build enough followers, if I can if I can do amazing things with my experiences, that's the best application that I can ever make to get to space as a, as a reporter, you know, as a reporter or as a communicator. Um, and so the, the only hard part of that was coming to terms with the fact that I was too old to apply for the ESA astronaut selection. I applied anyway, and I emailed them and sent them this video saying, look, at, I know I'm, I was two years too old by the time the, the form came by, but I applied anyway. And I actually stayed in the process for quite some time and they got back and they said, we can't. Um, and um, it, it that was really hard. That that was that was that was a very tough time. But I sort of went, well, you're just gonna have to make it up your own way, Neve. You know, like you're just gonna have to just do it whatever way you're meant to do it. And that that kind of keeps me going. Yeah, uh, Connor Purcell, who's another member, was watching. He says that you might read this out. Loving your story, Neve. I can't turn on the cam or speak as I'm parenting here. You show <laughs> great vulnerability, and I can totally tap into that feeling of. What is wrong with me when surrounded uh, in a world where the majority seem to just want to do one thing? Let's yeah. hope kids, especially kids who need it in the future, can see options for living a varied life with many chapters. You might have some thoughts on that. Thank you, Connor. Yeah, I agree, Connor. I think we we have to be careful that in our earnest uh, intention to give your child every opportunity that you didn't have, that you might you might make them feel burdened by the responsibility to fulfill your dreams for your child. And I, and I think I may have suffered from that a little bit, you know, at my parents, it was, you know, I, I, myself and my brother were the first two in both of their families to go to college, you know, so it was a, it was a huge thing for them that we went to college. And as I say, like <clears throat> they were, they did a lot to put me through college and, you know, I lived in, in, I had to live um, near UCD. We're from Dundalk, and I don't, I don't know how they did it, but I I was living on a very tight budget. So you feel, and I've spoken to other women about this, and it's only kind of come to me in the last year or so, is that you feel a responsibility to 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 finish that because you're very aware of of the sacrifices that your family have made for you. So I think it's about um allowing your child to foster all the different parts of themselves and encourage them to keep them all going without forcing them you know it's like a delicate balance really i think and to and to just like have them just kind of be very comfortable around their curiosity whatever that is and and finding ways for that to always stay fluid and, and have an open channel of communication around that. And I think they'll figure it out. But I think we're more than one thing. That's the thing as well. I think our education system uh, and, and the third level part of it is sort of geared towards going to college for a job. But university was once a place where you, you went to, to be inspired and to expand your mind. 
And I, I think that there's somewhere in the middle that might be better that I like the idea sometimes in American colleges that you can do a module on calligraphy and you can do a module on interpretive dance and then you can do a module on, but you can still major in science. I, I, I like the idea that we can decide for ourselves all the different parts of ourselves that make up our degree. And I would love to see a little bit more flexibility around that in the in the third level system. And maybe we might help develop people who are who are coming at these important STEM topics, but with their own point of view, which will, I think, allow us to innovate and problem solve probably more effectively as well. And just another one, uh, you mentioned women and girls a lot. Do you think that they, they've been alienated from science in some to some extent or, you know, do, do they need more more people like you, basically? I think it's improved an awful lot, um, Sean, but, you know, you, you you speak to a lot of women who are at the top of their career and it was a very lonely place for them to get to. And they had to be very, very tough, a lot of them, in order to get there. You know, so I would prefer that to be a, um, a more equal place. I think it's changing drastically, but I but I do think um, it's the it's the stories that we're we're telling young kids that, that we that we just have to be we just have to be very cognizant around. And I love the, you know, the science capital, that notion of science capital, that we are the sum of all these experiences. And so the piece that I'm working on to help break down any any sort of um, subconscious bias, because that's what I had, because I was growing I was growing up in a house where they were all saying you can do science, you can do this. But something was stopping me. Something made me go step back, Neve step back let somebody else go for it you don't get to do that and it was probably because i didn't see very many female astronauts there wasn't a very thriving space sector in ireland at the time so there's two ticks on that already for ireland because i i think there are many female astronauts and we have a thriving space sector but i think that culturally something was telling me about step back step back and so i think um making your guardians more comfortable around science and, and bringing science into the home kind of um, what that does is it kind of disempowers whatever, whatever, whatever culture is telling us. If the family is reinforcing something positive around you, I think you're stronger than going out into the world. You won't absorb those stories that, that, that um, society is telling you. So if you're in a society where the woman is oppressed but yet you've you've been grown up, you've grown up in a house where that that's couldn't be the opposite. You're not you're not going to be defined by what the rest of the world are telling you, you know. So so that's why I'm spending so much time on, on guardians. But yeah, there is still much to do. There yeah. is still much to a do. A lot of the explorers that I learned about when I was in school, I mean, they're all men, weren't they? Scott, yeah. the Antarctic and Magellan and you know, they're all men anyway, weren't they? All men, yeah. You're you're a, and, you're a science explorer, you're not a man. <laughs> Yeah, and what's what's amazing is I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that I'm doing is um, in a, in in preparation for the Antarctic is I'm working with a bunch of of women from Wexford crafters, uh, senior women um, who are who are amazing at needlepoint and stuff, and um, I'm kind of I guess I'm dedicating this uh, to the women of science who blazed a trail before me. You know, Mary put together her book, um, you know, uh, lab coats and lace. I think it's called, you know, the one where she where she highlighted all these Irish women that I had never heard about. I remember reading that book for the first time going, are you serious? You know, Annie Maunder is a massive uh, inspiration for me now. Agnes Clark yesterday, Storm was named after Agnes Clark. Um, you know, so those women were explorers and they were around at the same time that all these other explorers were you know and we heard about Leopold McClintock who went to the Arctic from the dog the Arctic fox and the 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 McCarthy brothers who went with uh, Tom Crean and uh, on Shackleton's mission endurance and stuff but at that time we had all these female scientists and botanists and, and we just didn't hear those stories enough so I think there was culturally there was um you know it it it, it you know that that wasn't um, a story that that people were comfortable hearing, but they want to hear them now. So I'm getting these women to make a, a sort of a blanket of sorts for me, and I'll be bringing it with me to the Antarctic, and it will be something that I'll bring with me everywhere I go, just to say thank you to those women who who have allowed me live the life that I want, because they're the women that really blazed a trail. And are you are you going to be happy as a science explorer on Earth then, or will you always be kind of dreaming of? still dream it off the moon <laughs> i will and I, and I hope you know that one day like, the, the, the call will come and like if you look at the how space tourism has taken off they will eventually have to get reported there will be one there will be an event 
that they'll get me to go up. Don't you know it? And I just have to work really hard and make sure I'm on that list. I might not be on the first list. Maybe I'm on the second list. But one day my day will come. That's, that's what I'm looking for. But in the meantime, yeah, you're right. I'll be an explorer of Earth. Maneve, thanks a million. It's been great. Uh, so I think we just ended there. And listen, thank you very much for, for a lovely, right. <laughs> a lovely hour session. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Sean.